darkness, my old friend. The enemy is not beaten, but he has met his master in the field. I'd like to say hi to Mom back there at home. I know she's worried about me, so uh, hello, Mom. And the vision that was planted in my brain. Diana Ross. Diana Ross. Everybody knows Diana Ross. You how many years old? Uh, 23 years old forever and ever. We are planning simultaneous action in many cities. Today I state that I am a candidate for President of the United States. Well, I want to confirm that I will be in the New Hampshire primary. I turn my car to the golden dance. Well, I think we have to support uh, the President and the administration. By the flash of a neon light, split the night and whisper. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the Congress, and my fellow Americans, I was thinking as I was walking down the aisle there tonight of what Sam Rayburn told me many years ago. The Congress always extends a very warm welcome to the President as he comes in. As 1967 faded into 1968, Lyndon Johnson knew he had compiled one of the most important presidencies for domestic policy in history. Our food programs have already helped millions avoid the horrors of famine. And last year, Medicare and Medicaid brought better health to more than 25 million Americans. Also, that great period in which he passed all this landmark civil rights legislation, dismantling much of institutionalized racism would give him a place in history. In terms of civil rights, no tree in the forest is as tall as Lincoln's except Lyndon Johnson. If ever there was a nation that was capable of solving its problems, it is this nation. Johnson had to be the best. He, he just was driven by this idea to be top dog. That's also how he felt about Vietnam. Since I reported to you last January, the enemy has been defeated in battle after battle. He knew all of that would make him a candidate for some future of Mount Rushmore, but he also knew that he was unlikely to be in any future Mount Rushmore because of the Vietnam War. This was the frustration that made Lyndon Johnson's fingernails sweat. B-52 bombers today made six raids on North Vietnamese positions around the United States Marine Base at Khe Sanh. Khe Sanh is a Marine base up in the northwestern corner of South Vietnam, and North Vietnamese forces start surrounding it and attacking it. 6,000 American Marines and 500 South Vietnamese Rangers are surrounded by 40,000 Communist troops. And General Westmoreland says, this is great. This is the big culminating battle that we've wanted. <laughs> Johnson is very worried that the outcome of this battle could change the outcome of the war. The eyes of the nation and of all history itself are on that little brave band of defenders at Quezon and the area that is around it. It's hard for me to imagine that the 60s would have turned out the way they did had there been no war in Vietnam. They raise their voices, their placards, and they march against the government. 1968 is the culminating moment for a generation of young people who really couldn't understand with so much unrest at home why there were so many resources going into the Vietnam War. I had a big sign on my bulletin board at home that said, alienation is when your country is at war and you want the other side to win. They're stampeding people. They just ran someone down back there. 
to understand the passion behind the anti-war movement, you have to keep in mind that the United States had a draft at the time that every year young men were waiting to find out would their number be the number that's chosen for service. President Johnson orders another 10,500 men sent to the war. And there was also a sense that even if you weren't chosen, your friends were chosen. So you were in it together as a generation. In the beginning, it was said we were simply sustaining and strengthening South Vietnam. Well, the early escalation did not satisfy that, and so the objective was extended to include nation building in South Vietnam. Then we were told that we were saving all of Southeastern Asia. Eugene McCarthy was this senator from Minnesota who entered the New Hampshire primary as an anti-Vietnam War candidate. And the young people flocked to his banner. They cut their hair off, they put on clean clothes. The saying at the time was that they were going clean for Gene. It's just crucial that you pay very close attention to the appearance you are presenting. Good afternoon. We're representing Senator McCarthy, who's seeking the Democratic nomination for president. Right. When McCarthy chose to be a candidate, I dropped out, you know, at the end of the first semester and uh, went to work for the campaign. The issue was Vietnam. You have to say that this war has gone too far. What makes 1968 such a pivotal year in American history is that an incumbent president couldn't seem to hold his party together. Will there be a, some kind of split in the Democratic Party? They're all getting quite vocal. Yes. They're saying that if the Republicans nominate a moderate or a liberal Republican, Democrats will come over and support him, and the conservatives in the Republican Party will go over and support yes. Lyndon Johnson. Yes. Is that possible? Yes. <laughs> Now, here is NBC News correspondent Frank McGee. The new communist campaign in Vietnam continues. Just after midnight their time, a band of Viet Cong raiders blew up a power installation and attacked two police stations in Saigon. At Hue, the old imperial capital, 400 miles to the north, the Viet Cong is holding on to part of the town. I remember there was a graphic put up on the screen on the news. It was these cartoon explosions that were just all over this little strip of a country on the other side of the world. It all amounts to the most ambitious series of communist attacks yet mounted, spreading violence into at least 10 provincial capitals, stretching the entire length of the country. For a year that was supposed to start off as being a grand, sophisticated, you know, exciting year, um, it was redefined uh, literally in 48 hours by Tet. The attacks on the night of the 31st were really my first exposure to major combat. Initial reports were very clouded and we couldn't really get a good grasp of what was happening except something was happening all over Vietnam. This is the main Vietnamese language radio station in Saigon. This neighborhood is called Ban Khu, not Trang. Saigon Airport, Hang Son Yot. Heavy casualties in Hue, South Vietnam. Near the rounds flying low overhead. The Tet Offensive simultaneous attacks on every city and town in South Vietnam shocked the American people. The enemy very deceitfully has taken advantage of the Tet Truce in order to create maximum consternation uh, within uh, South Vietnam, uh, particularly in the populated areas. Every year there was a ceasefire on the Lunar New Year holidays known as Tet. And they believed that year would be the same thing. But that wasn't what happened. These are American combat military police and troops from the 101st Airborne Division, half a block from the U.S. Embassy in Viet Cong snipers and suicide commandos were holed up inside the embassy compound and firing from surrounding buildings. Now CIA men and MPs have gone into the embassy and are trying to get the snipers out by themselves. Military police got back into the compound of the two and a half million dollar embassy complex at dawn. The fighting went on for a total of six hours before the last known Viet Cong raider was killed. From the small residence of the embassy's mission coordinator, George Jacobson, who'd been hiding out all alone all morning. 
You had quite an escape at the very end. How did that happen? Well, they put riot gas into the bottom floors of my house, which, of course, would drive whoever was down uh, below up top where I was. They had thrown me a pistol uh, about 10 minutes before this occurred. And uh, with all the luck that I've had uh, all of my life, uh, I got him before he got me. With the I'm pistol, sorry. and he had what? An M16. And you got him. That just really scared people because it, that showed Americans being attacked, the Marines unable to defend the embassy. In reality, they did defend the embassy. <laughs> they, they killed them and drove them back, but it's not the way it looked on TV. And then at the same time, the destruction of this beautiful ancient city of Wei, and you know, my God, what are we doing here? been like this all weekend in Hawaii. One nasty little firefight right after another. Rounds going overhead. A little firefight across the Perfume River. What do you think of it at a time like this? Oh, keeping down. Bullets are flying over here too fast. Well, we weren't prepared for combat in an urban area. So we had to go in and to use the Marine Corps phrase, we had to adapt, uh, improvise, and overcome the many obstacles and challenges that we had. How do you cross the street? How do you go in and attack a fortified position, which is a home? Colonel Cheatham, uh, what are your men about to do? Well, I've, I've got two companies here that are just about to clear the next two blocks up. What kind of fighting is it going to be? It's house to house and from room to room. Nope. How do you ever expected to experience this kind of street fighting in Vietnam? No, I didn't. I think this is the first time the Marine Corps has been street fighting since Seoul in 1950. Most of the fighting happens in the countryside. But the North Vietnamese political and military leadership believed that large-scale military action in the cities will stimulate a popular uprising and basically make the American position in South Vietnam untenable. He apparently hoped that when his troops mingled with the people, intimidated them, terrorized them, that they would join his ranks. But the South Vietnamese people don't rise up. The biggest fact is that the stated purposes of the general uprising, a military victory or a psychological victory, have failed. The Tet Offensive may have been a huge military defeat for the NLF and the North Vietnamese, but psychologically, it was an enormous victory because it suggested that this war had no end. We lost a lot of people. We probably had to drop back today to regroup. How do you feel yourself? I'm scared, I guess. But I'm hoping we're to drop back and regroup because I lost my engineer and I need another man to help me with my job. There was something deeply corrupt and even evil in our involvement. And I'll tell you the moment that defined Tet all over the world. It was the moment when General Luan, who was the chief of police of the Saigon Police Department, pulled out a snub-nosed 38 revolver and held it up to the temple of a Viet Cong and shot him. Bang. Eddie Adams of the AP took the picture. It was the next day all over the world and it was injected right into the center of the American brain, and it made Americans feel morally unclean. Can it be that we, who are the most idealistic people in the world, can it be that we are actually evil? That was what Tet did. Awful sick of it, I'll be so glad to go home. I don't know. It's, just, it's the worst area we've been in since I've been in Vietnam. You think it's worth it? Yeah, I, I don't know. They, they say we're fighting for something. I don't know. One thousand striking sanitation workers marched on Memphis City Hall this afternoon and demanded Mayor Henry Loeb hear their grievances. On February 1st in Memphis, two sanitation workers were crushed in the back of a garbage truck. 
Memphis policy did not allow them to seek shelter in a rainstorm because the white citizens of Memphis did not want to see sanitation workers in their yards and that sort of thing. The rain was so terrible that they got into the back of this barrel trash truck and a broom fell on the, the lever and compacted them with the garbage and killed them. The situation in, in Memphis was local. That sense that they were desperate led them to accept these conditions until they just got to be intolerable. And then they went on strike. The garbage collectors, predominantly Negro, want higher pay and union recognition. Public employees cannot strike against their employer. I suggest that you go back to work. Police used riot control gas and nightsticks this afternoon to break up a disturbance among a group of striking garbage men. Uh, over a thousand of us were maced and marched that stretched from down at the beginning of that corner up to here uh, was broken up. That became the cry, essentially, for the entire Negro community to say, well, this, the, the fight was on. I saw that strike as another part of the emerging movement of nonviolence in the United States. And that's the way King saw it as well. The vast majority of Negroes in our country are still perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. And it is criminal to have people working at a full-time job getting part-time income. I think King was inspired by that movement. And he saw that as a poor people's movement. We are poverty-stricken, and we have been at the bottom too long. It was always hard to be Martin Luther King, but it was really hard in 1967, 68. He had alienated many of his moderately conservative white allies by his attack on the war in Vietnam. Let us save our national honor. Stop the bombing and stop the war. On the other hand, his continued insistence on nonviolence had alienated him from many activists who felt that nonviolence had run its course. Is this what you want to do, destroy the country? I destroy a whole bunch of y'all. You want to destroy who now? You want to destroy who? You and a whole bunch of others like you, anybody who gets in our way. People started saying, we aren't going to get our rights in the Martin Luther King way, so what are we going to do? We're going to build black power. We're going to build black companies. We're going to build black organizations. We're going to have our own power center. Black power? Black power, my friends, means that we are developing now a new breed of cats. This is what spurred Stoker Carmichael. The major enemy is the hunky and his institutions of racism. That's the major enemy. This is part of what spurred the Black Panther Party to organize. No more pigs in our community. It's the pigs and their mentors, the people who control the pigs, the power structure. So there was a sea change in the civil rights movement and its goals, and that impacts the black perspective being played out every day in American society. Black and I'm proud. There's no ambiguity there. You know, this is a civil rights anthem. This is a black power anthem. I want you to know that I'm a man, a black man, a soul brother. James Brown had been the dominant black musical figure. He was the best showman by far in any genre of music. He also was a smart businessman. He took over booking of his own shows, on radio stations. This is Tony Scott from WRDW Augusta, a James Brown station. So he was the hardest working man in show business. Then he becomes soul brother number one. James Brown program! He's black and he's proud. Mr. Brown is number one soul brother in the United States. You know, there's no question that James Brown was a huge influence for Sly Stone. You hear it in the music. But Sly Stone was different. There were women and the band was integrated. That was a big deal. Sly Stone is a product of the black church and also a child of the Bay Area, which is incredibly progressive politics. And he also was a radio DJ. There was no show better. There was no band more interesting to look at. And he was writing hit song after hit song after hit song. 
Sly came out with Haight Ashbury slash Pimp outfits, it was over. Every R&B group had to flip it. So in 1968, the Supremes put out Love Child. And it's this whole idea of you know, what it's like to grow up in a tenement. I started my life in an old, cold, run-down tenement slum. Diana Ross is singing this? You know, for the Supremes, this is a darker, more mature album. They're actually singing about some social issues. And then you always got to remember, you know, Motown promoted itself as the sound of young America. They never promoted themselves as the sound of black America. For Motown, that was a big step. Have you thought about graduate school? No. Would you mind telling me then what those four years of college were for? What was the point of all that hard work? You got me. The Graduate is probably the most important movie of the 60s. Maybe it's the best movie of the 60s. Get on! Get on! The pervasive sense of alienation, of being not at one with the world around you, that's the idea of the 60s, and that is the crucial idea of 1968. Now, you know, we are just about the friendliest folks you would ever want to meet. In Bonnie and Clyde, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway play this impossibly attractive couple, robbing banks as some kind of, you know, sexual sublimation. What's it like? When it was released in 67, people didn't know how to take it. What you mean, in prison? So it was re-released in early 1968. Armed robbery. It had a tone that challenged people that they hadn't seen in a film before. And this was a movie that changed the way people regarded how those sort of movies were done. So we go to see Planet of the Apes at an all-black theater in Brooklyn. And we're having a base time because, like, we identified with the apes. Hell yeah. Fuck, fuck Charlton Heston. I mean, you know, why are we rooting for him? Do we want something? Come on, speak. Come on. Charlton speak. Heston lands on this planet, and he realizes that this planet is literally a planet of the apes, except the apes are now in charge. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. Charlton Heston would have to confront the tragedy of a broken civilization. You maniacs! You blew it up! Damn you! God damn you all to hell! This was a hit. It really captured something very deep in the psyche of America in a year when the cities were falling apart. Please go in your homes. Please go in your homes. In 1965, after the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts passed, you have the Watts riots. And then in 66 and 67 in Newark, in Detroit. Dozens of people are killed, and Johnson is chagrined. And he says, look what I've done for the blacks. Why are they doing this to me? There had to be a response to that by the establishment. And that's what led to the Kerner Commission. We need to know the answer, I think, to three basic questions about these riots. What happened? Why did it happen? What can be done to prevent it from happening again and again? Now, asking the question and accepting the answer are two different things. And they didn't like the answer. For the last few days, this country has lived under indictment, a charge of white racism, national in scale, terrible in its effects. The evidence to support that charge has now been presented in the text of a report released just last night. Our nation, says the report, is moving toward two separate societies, black and white, separate but unequal. Get your hands up. Get your hands up. Your hands up. Let's go. You told people by the Civil Rights Act that we would have more yeah, freedom, and yeah. you told them that they passed this law and we'd have this. And when you give people hope, and you don't fulfill that hope, then you are more likely to have problems. 
Every time I come to town, you overcharge me for everything I get. And how in the world do you expect for me to get it? Then if I go out here and steal something. Now that's what make criminals out of people. You're not gonna give them nothing, just enough to keep you eating. Yeah, I eat breakfast this morning. I don't know where dinner coming from. How do you think I feel? In 12 out of 24 riots studied by the commission, the spark that touched off disorder was a violent response of our own institutions. First one drops her hand, dead man. The answer was that American institutions created this and that it was going to take a lot of resources to deal with it. If the police in this country could just run it for about two years, then we could walk in the parks and on the streets in safety. And you are doing it. George Wallace is a Southern segregationist politician and a former Democrat, and he runs for president as an independent and taps into the deepest wellsprings of American rage and reaction. Well, I think uh, the Negro, uh, no doubt about it, has got out of hand. And I think Wallace uh, will enforce law and order. You can see character in his eyes. He's got a little spot to him, a little backbone, you know. That's what, that's what the American people need. Wallace realized that if you could remove overt racism from conservatism, that lots of Americans would go for it. Because they were tired of the rights revolution. It was too much change for them too fast. Well, let's come to the basic question. Would you let your daughter marry a Negro? I don't even want to, uh, in fact, I don't even want to get into discussion of race, really, because the most important thing in our country is maintaining law and order. Race relations are going to work themselves out. I don't believe in any marriages of, of Negro and white, if you want. I'm candid and honest about it. I don't think it's good for either race. I think uh, the races ought to remain uh, uh, intact. One of the most astute men in the field of politics and world affairs on the scene today. Ladies and gentlemen, the former Vice President of the United States, Richard M. Nixon. When 1968 begins, it's an open question whether Richard Nixon can win anything. You have that stigma as a loser yes. because of losing two big contests. How do, you, how do you plan to combat that? The way you combat it is to win something. Nixon lost two big elections to Jack Kennedy, and he lost to Pat Brown in California. And people would say, the guy's a political loser, talented, yes, but a loser. America will be watching on March 12. Let the message go out from New Hampshire. The people of New Hampshire want a change, and America will have a change in November. Thank you. Television is a vital political meeting place. To be successful, a candidate must use the medium and use it well. Richard Nixon prefers informal, no-holds-barred discussions. New Hampshire was the first time we saw a new innovation in televised campaigning. Richard Nixon's aides would gather a group of ordinary citizens and have them, instead of the media, asking questions. Any further questions that you have? Uh, and they made it look like Richard Nixon was this brave truth-teller who was willing to face down any critic, when in fact it was completely staged. This is the Nixon Answer, in which Richard Nixon discusses the issues with citizens of New Hampshire. Lawlessness, uh, crime, uh, is a major problem in this country today. And we talk about civil rights. You know what the most important civil right in this country is? It's, it's the right to be safe in the streets, to be safe in your home. Nixon's campaign in New Hampshire was a classic. <laughs> there is a new Nixon, the reporters were saying. He's much better disciplined. Uh, he also is more relaxed. He takes criticism well. I plan to shake a lot of hands, and I have a good, strong hand, and I also uh, like to talk to people. The intelligence of the old Nixon combined with the better behavior and outlook of the new Nixon, that's the candidate in 68. I am myself, and I'm going to continue to play that role. If people looking at me say that's a new Nixon, then all that I can say is, well, maybe you didn't know the old Nixon. After the initial attacks of the Tet Offensive were beaten back, Hue was still occupied by the enemy. It had been completely overrun. 
The North Vietnamese are deeply entrenched in buildings and bunkers, carefully camouflaged, waiting for the Marines to move forward to gun them down in the open. They have been holding up for three weeks in what has become the longest, bloodiest battle of the war. Initially, when we went into the Citadel, the Citadel being a fortress that was roughly four square miles, it was occupied by some 7,000 NVA. What remains of an old tower fortress built more than a century ago again is put to combat use. That's the North Vietnamese strong point. That's where the rocket firing had been coming from. Now the Marines are trying to silence the firing with grenade launchers. I had a strong group of Marines. They were magnificent in every way, unwavering and going forward under intense fire. After 24 days of heavy fighting, the Americans and the South Vietnamese troops finally pushed the enemy out of the Citadel. The estimate was that 80% of the city was damaged or destroyed, and 80% of its population was homeless. In order to preserve the city of Hue, we had to destroy the city of Hue. Whatever price the communists paid for this offensive, the price to the Allied cause was high. For if our intention is to restore normalcy, peace, serenity to this country, the destruction of those qualities in this, the most historic or probably serene of all South Vietnam cities, is obviously a setback. Walter Cronkite in the CPS Evening News had a very large audience, and when he delivered what he did from Vietnam, it had an impact. But it is increasingly clear to this report that the only rational way out will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. He felt he had a public obligation to actually share with the Americans the fact that no, our government is not telling us the truth. No matter what we say, it is our napalm burning thatched huts our anti-personnel bombs being used against simple people. Our gas reported to be non-lethal. The other day was reported to kill only 10% of the adults who inhale it and 90% of the children. So it's only semi-lethal. The big surprise of the first primary of campaign 68 has been the strength of Senator Eugene McCarthy. They hope for perhaps 35%. The total they ran up was a dream come true. The results on election night gave us a sense that there was a real opportunity here. We even got the feeling like, well, maybe we can run a national campaign after all. Let's take a run at this thing. The McCarthy vote was just not a peace vote. It was an anti-Johnson vote on many other issues. Mr. Nixon, do you think you can be stopped now? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me put it. <laughs> well, sir, that's a. That's a fair enough question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can say this, I'm not going to stop myself, that's for sure. New Hampshire was critical. But you know what? We looked at the numbers, and Nixon's total in New Hampshire was more than all the other candidates in both parties combined. New Hampshire was a significant turning point. It locked in a certain popularity that he had. And at the same time, you had the Democrats fighting among themselves. The president and his advisors are most concerned about what tonight's returns mean in terms of Bobby Kennedy. McCarthy worked hard, had good financing and good organization in New Hampshire, one of the president's advisors says. But McCarthy and New Hampshire don't mean a thing unless they mean Bobby is coming in. Would this encourage you at all to change your position I have no supporting plans. Uh, Yeah, I have no President plans Johnson. at the moment, other than, uh, as I say, maybe I'll have something further to say after uh, I see the rest of the figures. Would you Thank accept you. a draft, Senator? I don't think anybody suggested that. Well, I'm suggesting it now. Would you Senator, accept it? I don't think that's a practical matter. Would you refuse it? Well, I don't just don't think, will you accept one? <laughs> and I don't think anybody suggested that that's going to happen. All of Bobby's more seasoned political advisors were saying, you don't depose an incumbent president. 
All you're going to do is rip the party apart and make sure that Nixon or whoever is going to win. He was also worried that if he ran against Johnson, people would chalk it up to Bobby's ruthless desire to be president or his loathing of Lyndon Johnson. Bluntly put, Lyndon Johnson and Bobby Kennedy hated one another. This man is mean, bitter, vicious animal in many ways. I believe that Bobby is half his governor, Jeff Hallman, he's half his mayor, he's half his Negroes, and he's half his Catholics, and he's half them just systematically one after the other each day. All of it makes Bobby look like a great hero and makes me look like a son of a bitch. Bobby Kennedy doesn't go after LBJ until he's politically wounded. I am announcing today my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. I run because it is now unmistakably clear that we can change these disastrous, divisive policies only by changing the men who are now making them. Can you imagine the anger that Johnson had? Here, here was his nightmare. I hear LBJ is trying to get rid of 150 pounds, Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> Make a sweep all the way down from London back this way. You understand me? All right, lock arms, four of you on each side of the street. Let's, let's sweep it all the way down. Today in Memphis, a 3,000 man protest march led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in support of a seven-week-old city sanitation workers' strike. The strike has turned into a major racial issue in Memphis. We were an orderly march coming up to Main Street. I was in the middle of it, and there were some unruly people, no doubt loud people, and I saw the police in a phalanx and said to myself, they're going to break up this march. Then suddenly, there are a handful of men busting a window over here. Chaos has just broken out downtown. All right, Negro youths are smashing windows. Then I went back to King in the first rank and said, Martin, the police up there are planning to break us up, and you're going to be a major target. So we're going to turn around and go back. That sound you just heard was the sound of a tear gas fired by a police officer in an attempt to thwart this unruly demonstration. That's it. You're that son of a bitch! If you do not leave this area, you will face arrest. We urge you to return to your homes immediately for your own safety. Get out of here! We must not allow the events of the day to cause us to let up. That would be a tragic error. There will be continued marches. We will not stop. I don't think King had a choice. He had to go back to Memphis and prove that there could be a nonviolent march. In order to prove that all are concerned, we have uh, the right to count. There's two are behind you, and one is right here. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. No other question so preoccupies our people. It is a new war in Vietnam. The enemy now has the initiative. Now there are finite limits to the destruction Vietnam can absorb. There are only so many buildings and so many people. The time is at hand when we must decide whether it's futile to destroy Vietnam in the effort to save it. We are prepared to move immediately toward peace through negotiations. Daddy tried to the end to get peace with Vietnam. I'm no goddamn fascist. I'm trying to settle this thing. Both daughters, husbands are going out. One of them's going to Hue and the other's going to Lang. Right there in the middle of it. God knows I'm more concerned than anybody. I followed Chuck out to get on the plane to Vietnam. And so there's a picture of Chuck and me carrying this tin of cookies. And before he left on the airplane, I am now pregnant, but it's secret. And he says to me, I have signed my will, and if I'm killed, the Marine Corps will take care of everything. Now, as in the past, the United States is ready to send its representatives to any forum at any time to discuss the means of bringing this ugly war to an end.
By the end of March, President Johnson is in despair. Bobby Kennedy, his great nightmare, is in the race. I'm interested in the future of this country and what this country must stand for. And I don't think it's been satisfactory up to the present time. So this, on top of all the other bad news that he had in March, pushes LBJ over the edge. Finally, let me say this. He told very few people about the last part of his March 31st speech. Of course, Mother knew that he was going to do it that night. I talked to him and said, please, don't do it. But Daddy had made his decision. With America's sons in the field far away, with America's future under challenge right here at home, I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office. He just was worn out. Accordingly. By all of these heavy, heavy burdens. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I stood in the wings and, and cried. <laughs> Good night, and God bless all of you. But I think it lifted a lot from his shoulders. And he said, I did the best I could. It was very hard. It's just very, very hard. In terms of politics, it's still a long time. A lot of things can happen. The next president of the United States, Hubert Humphrey. Richard Nixon. I've come to Oregon. We had rather a successful primary there. This campaign train is on a life or death mission. At Columbia University, students barricade the university building. The students push forward and the police push back. <laughs> Washington, Chicago, Detroit, New York, racial confrontation, Violent the state of emergency. My eyes have seen the glory. 